Okay, uh, thanks everyone for coming. Um, the room's pretty full, I wasn't expecting that. Um, so the, the title of this talk is JavaScript Brights Solved the Dilemma. It aims to uh, show how common mistakes in JavaScript are easy, avoidable dilemma. So just to show of hands, just to start off, who here considers himself as a JavaScript developer? Okay, quite a few actually. Uh, none of you know the answers to any of the questions. <laughs> <laughs> and who here has played with Adam? Okay, actually quite a few as well. That's my key. We're done for some reason. Wasn't banking on any of that. <laughs> okay, so why am I up here talking? Um, I am Tech Lead with Popolo here, one of the sponsors. Um, we're a software developer. I've worked with Popolo now for the last year and a half or so, and um, I've been a software developer for now about ten or so years. And um, for those ten years or so, I've been mainly a Java developer, but I'm working on and off with JavaScript. And uh, for the last two years, I've been working quite a bit with Scala, which led me down the functional programming path. And which to, and in the end, then has returned uh, brought me to Ellen. Um, so, uh, Mary in her last talk mentioned that she didn't really understand JavaScript, and I I understand that because with ten years of JavaScript, I still don't really understand it. Um, and I hope this talk kind of highlights some of those problems. So, just to set the scene, I'm just going to tell a quick story. So, there's a bit um, of front end work to be done, and of course, I stick my hand up. I think, yeah, I'm great at front end stuff. I can do that. I like doing it. It's great. So, I start working on it. And um, I get my feature built and I uh, deploy it to my local test environment, which I start testing. And it's not long before I realize I've made 101 mistakes. I have typos, I have compiler errors, all sorts of problems. And I go through them one by one and I start fixing them. And I eventually get my code um, fixed, I get it te um, tested locally, I get it reviewed, and I get it merged to develop. And I feel great. I feel happy, delighted, I can move on to the next thing. The code gets pushed into the test environment and the QA start having to look at it. And it's not long before they grab me by the ear, pulling me across and saying, there's a problem with this, it's not running in IE. Of course, I have a Mac, I never test in IE, why would I? Um, <laughs> <laughs> but there could be any a number of mistakes that you, you would easily miss in JavaScript. Um, so, obviously, I feel a bit like this guy, I feel a bit frustrated. This could easily be avoidable um, if I was using something else. Um, so just to hammer home the point of a bit of a pop quiz here, okay, so I'm going to hope that maybe this is a little bit interactive, people get involved. Um, so the first one here, probably, there was a lot of hands up there for the JavaScript, so I'm sure everybody already knows this now. But double equals versus triple equals, it's uh, slightly different in JavaScript, and um, for a junior developer they might not immediately know what the difference is. But just to give you the answer quickly, because I'm sure you all know, uh, the triple equals checks the type where the first one doesn't. So the first one will be false, the second one will be true. Sorry, yeah. wrong way around. <laughs> <laughs> Ten years and I still don't know. <laughs> okay, so the second one, type of null. Logically, you might think type of null shouldn't have any type. Um, but actually, actually, if you execute this in JavaScript, it'll actually tell you it's an object. So logically, you might think then that null is an instance of an object, but actually it's not. Okay, So a little bit of confusion there. Okay, so. Um, booleans are a real pain point in JavaScript, so in this case here we're checking to see true plus true, you might think should be equal to true, but actually what happened here because of uh, type coercion in JavaScript, uh, the first true gets converted to integer 1, and the second uh, true gets converted to integer 1 as well, so that becomes 2 is equal to the true, which is actually false. right? Um, so here it gets a little bit more interesting, we have a string 10 minus 3, and logic, you might think the answer to this is 10, or sorry, 7. <laughs> <laughs> Doing this on purpose. <laughs> uh, so, yeah, you'd be right, okay? So the answer is 7. But what if I flip that around now and I had a plus? Anybody know the answer to this? 103. Yes, exactly. What's the type? The type is a string, okay? So the types are different as well. Um, so now we get a little bit more complicated, okay? So I have an extra here and I call it to string on it. So anybody know what? The answer to this is if I run the browser. You knew the last one though, come on. Is it a string? Well, it's not, it's actually a compiler error, okay. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so. Yeah, that's a first bug, okay. But what if I put double dots in it? Anybody know? No, no, everybody's afraid to answer now. <laughs> string, okay, so it works, right? So, and the reason that, um, that this works is because three dot converses, gets converted to a float, and float has the function to string on it. Okay. And um, what about these three? Okay, so a little bit more complex again. Forty-two space dot to fixed. 
Anyone want to take a stab on that one? Doesn't compile. It works. <laughs> We're picking on you now. <laughs> what about the next one? 42.00 is a string. It's an uncut. <laughs> you kill yourself here. <laughs> what about the last one? 42 space dot space to fixed. Undefined. <laughs> it works. <laughs> <laughs> we won't be taking our CV. <laughs> <laughs> what about this one? Maybe you know the answer to this? Everyone's afraid to answer. Yeah, <laughs> that's what I want. Okay. Nobody? Answer's nine, okay. Let me know why? Great, I don't even know. <laughs> so it gets uh, type course down to true, false, and a string. And then we we do the, the length function on the string true false, and that's why it becomes nine. Okay. So my goal is to introduce Elm, is to show you how you don't have any of these problems with Elm, and show how easy these bugs can obviously creep into JavaScript, and we can easily avoid them using Elm. It's all to promote the idea of function program, and just provide some food for thought for for our, maybe you want to try some Elm. So what is Elm? Kind of mention it a little bit. It's a pure functional static uh, programming language. Um, it compiles down to JavaScript, um, and if you look at any videos online, the first thing they'll probably always tell you is there's no runtime exceptions. Okay, so companies like GoRed Inc. Um, advertise over 100,000 lines of code for over five years in production with zero runtime exceptions. It's also got great performance, and um, so it uses the virtual DOM um, in its implementation by default. And in recent uh, uh, performance test versus Angular 2 and uh, React, it's come out on top. I don't know, there might be some changes after recently, but um, it also has a unique thing called uh, semantic versioning, which prevents developers pushing, breaking changes to public APIs without incrementing the major version of the package. Okay, so if you want to, if you're using a public package and you're pulling down um, patch changes, you can pull them down to your heart's content, you won't, um, you won't cause any breaking changes. If you want to pull down the major package um, update, you will have to make some changes to your public API. And it'll actually be, uh, tell you exactly what you need to change as well to make it work. Okay. Um, the one other thing I'd like to add to this is, is when Elm compiles, it just works. It's great. You just don't have to worry about anything going wrong in the browser. Um, so my first gripe is null and other undefined. Tony Hoare developed this um, as a way of assigning an empty value to a variable in 1965. He later described it as his billion dollar mistake for obvious reasons. Probably isn't a developer in the room here who hasn't seen um, a null pointer exception. Um, so I'm just going to show how this manifests itself in JavaScript. So I don't know what happens if I execute this in the browser. I'm getting no responses now because everyone's afraid. <laughs> so again, I'm going to get an exception. So I don't know why I get an exception. Or, sorry, a compiler error. Better check that. Should it happen the other way around? Exactly, right? So it's not immediately obviously um, in JavaScript, but null and undefined are subtly different. So they should be the right way around, correct? You got one right. <laughs> <laughs> so another uh, function here I have, um, so this, you could think of this as maybe a third party API, um, which you call with some variable. If that variable is, um, is falsely, um, it's returning an empty, it's actually returning nothing. So, but if it's truthy, it's returning an object. You might assume that what you're passing to this function is gonna be truthy, and you're going to um, attempt to use the, the function that's on the, the object is returned. Um, but again, um, this will return undefined if you pause something that's uh, falsely. So how does JavaScript, or sorry, Elm get around this? It uses maybe types, so I don't know if people have seen in Java or um, Scala um, the optional types that they have. Basically it says um, something is either there or it's not there, all right? Um, so Elm has the same concept as a maybe, something is just there or there's nothing, okay? It, uh, it also has no concept then of null or undefined. Um, you just don't have those keywords, they're not there. You don't have to worry about them. Um, and then it also has the static type that I'll go into a little bit later in the application. So how do I use these, right? So I have here a maybe type uh, called my string, and it's either just a string or it's nothing. And to use this then, I must use pattern matching in, um, in Elm. So what I'm saying here is case my string of, and I give it the two possible outcomes of that. Is. It's either just there, and that gives me the path 
um, that um, should be executed when it's there and nothing if it's not there. Okay? Um, so that leads me on to my next gripe, which are switch statements and missing break, and sta uh, break statements. So here I have a switch statement and it has two possible outcomes, right? Um, default and case. But what happens if I call eight on this or two, uh, two or something like that? Let me know what gets executed. Both logs. Both logs, yeah, exactly. Because there's nothing checking that I'm missing the break um, on the default. And people can be lazy and they can easily leave it out and they can easily get it in production without tests. So Elm gets around this with its pattern matching. So I've mentioned this in the last uh, gripe, but it's a little bit more advanced here, right? So what I'm doing is I'm, I'm pattern matching on my number and I'm giving it the three options that it can be. So it can be one or two um, or underscore, but also uh, pattern matching and then it returns a type, okay? So the type must be the same for all cases, okay? In this um, um, example here, I'm assigning a constant result and it's gonna be a type string, right? Because all three paths um, return a string. The wildcard, so the default value is the underscore, um, okay? But what if I was to miss one of those paths, like it, um, um, so if I left out, for example, the underscore, Ellen would actually complain and tell me, it will give me a compiler error, and I'd say, this case does not have branches for all possibilities, which leads me into my next gripe, compiler errors. In JavaScript, your compiler error, your JavaScript is compiled inside your browser, which is too late, really, to fix it. Um, so you might have seen, um, Lots of compiler errors or exceptions, depending on what happens inside your browser. Um, and um, if you were using something like Angular or something like that, you would see even larger exceptions, like you know, which would become very, very difficult to debug and figure out what's causing them and, and things like that. So Elm takes a different approach on exceptions and compiler errors. Um, it, it uses pretty clear exceptions. Okay, so. Um, the example I had in the previous, um, where the case was miss missing, this is the, the uh, compiler error I would get. Um, so it's telling me this case does not have branches for all possibilities, but not only does it tell me what the, the problem is, it tells me how to fix it, okay? So it tells me here that I need to account for the following values, values that are not one or two, and I need to add a, a branch to, uh, to cover this pattern. Sorry, I just grabbed a drink. Um, so, Just a little bit more of a complex example. I have here a function that was adding two variables, and for some reason I passed, I thought I could add an integer and a string. Just like I did in the previous, in one of the earlier slides where I was adding a string 10 and an integer. And we'll complain about that, it'll know that one side is a string and one is an integer, and it'll know it'll tell me that I can't do that. Okay, so in this case it's telling me um, the right hand side is expected to be an integer because I'm using a single plus, but it's actually a string. It'll actually give me then, how to fix it, okay? So it give me a hint how to fix it. It's telling me if, I, if I'm trying to append strings in Adam, I need to use the double operator, not the plus one that I'm attempting to use. And not only that, then, it, it gives me the links to the documentation that explains this. And it gives me some further explanation around, around the exception. And they actually promote this in Adam, so if you have an exception, or sorry, a compiler error that you don't find immediately clear, they will um, say that you should create um, an issue in, in the GitHub, okay? So the next uh, issue I have is types and comparisons. So we've seen some of these already, um, and I'm just going to give another little bit of a pop quiz. Anybody know what the answer to this one is? False. False. It's always false, but if you read the IEEE standard, okay. So, um, but you can imagine a junior developer coming in looking at this. They would imagine it might be true, like okay. If, um, so it is false. Similar example. So parse int. It's clearly not an integer. You imagine maybe you might throw an exception, but it actually doesn't, it parses to not a number, and we have the same issue again, okay? What about this? Anybody know? Okay, so it's a string, type uh, triple equals another string. It's true, okay, so logically that, that makes sense. But what if I create the string slightly differently? Right, so I'm creating it with the constructor here. Anyone want to take that? No? False, well, yeah, we're starting to get it now, right? JavaScript's <laughs> confusing. <laughs> okay. What about this one? An empty array is equal to, double equal to false. Will that code get executed? Yeah. It does. Okay. Okay, so I'm thinking, okay, maybe maybe it should be true to you, so I go and remove the false. Okay. So now does it get executed? It 
does, okay? So the empty array can be false and true. Yeah, go figure. Um, <laughs> what about this one? One is less than two is less than three. Anybody know what the answer is? It's true, right? Okay, so if I flip it around, three is greater than two is greater than one. False. <laughs> right? Makes right. sense. Yeah. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so I have another function here, add, okay, so we're passing no parameters to the add function. And what we're doing is we're actually uh, directly accessing the arguments array and summing them all up and returning the result. If I call this with um, three variables here, so five, five, and ten, obviously the result should be ten, and it, or sorry, be twenty, and it is. But if I call that one of the variables were a string, you remember earlier on the slides when I summed them together? Yeah, exactly. So um, if you were doing something like that, you can imagine it'd be problematic if you were passing variables there. Okay. So how does that get around that? It uses static types that I mentioned a couple of times. So it has strings, integer, floats, records, which are a little bit like JavaScript objects. And um, it has union types, and then it has no, not a number. So it doesn't have that concept. It has a function to check if something is not a number. So how do I use these? So I can find here um, x is equal to 4, and that will be implicitly um, uh, typed as a number. Um, and I can annotate it to say it's a, exactly an integer if I give it um, the colons above the, the variable declaration. I can also define custom types, like uh, here I'm defining a person's age in the, as, a, as an alias um, integer. And I can use that throughout my application and say anywhere I'm trying to use a person's age, it'll be in, inferred as an integer, but we can use it as a person's age. Um, and then I'm declaring a, 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 a result boolean here. And what I'm saying is string integer is double equal to 10, right? So it's, there's no triple equals as well. Um, and when I do this, I get one of these pretty exceptions telling me I can't, I can't do this. Like, you know, that doesn't make sense. You're comparing a string to a, an integer. They're different types, okay? So this leads me on then to the next thing I want to talk about is objects and how we index them in JavaScript. So um, there's multiple different ways of indexing things in JavaScript, and we'll see why these are problematic. So let's say I had an API return an object, something like this, and this got run in the browser. What would happen? Yeah, exactly, syntax error, right? I can't have dash in, in my uh, the keys in my object, okay? So I can fix that by wrapping it in a code like this, and my exception or my uh, exception goes away, okay. And then I typically use the dot annotation when I write JavaScript. So I would typically do something like this. But then if I wanted to use the full name, I would try to do this. Does anyone know what the problem is with this? It's not a number, right? Okay. Does anyone know why it's not a number? Minus the variable not defined. Exactly, exactly. Okay, so JavaScript sees that as person.full, which is not defined in my object, minus name, which is Dave. So undefined minus string, it's not a number. Okay, so I can fix that using the square brackets, but then I have lots of messy code, like you know, where I have dot notations or square notations, and it gets a bit confusing sometimes. So I can fix this in L um, by um, <clears throat> using Elm's records. So Elm has a thing called records and I define it, define it as a type alias. So here I define my person um, and it, it, there are some strict rules around how you define your, your records. So they must start with an uppercase um, uh, letter um, and each key then must start with a lowercase. They, they can contain the dash, so the minus, but they can contain the underscores. And from that then you get an automatic um, uh, a default constructor, I guess. Um, so I can create instances of that by doing person and I can give it the, the values in, in line like that. And they will get um, assigned to the, the keys in order that I assign them to. And then I can uh, access them all in only one way. So joe.fullname will be the, the, the accessor for that. Uh, just know as well that they're immutable objects too. Um, so you, you can't change them. When you, when you update them, you're essentially creating new a new record, and we'll see that in a bit. So I mentioned a couple of things about functions, and functions could be problematic when it comes to refactoring, okay? So if I take this example that I had previously, um, we 
decide that we don't like accessing the arguments um, array, and we refactor that to say, okay, we're only going to take two, two variables. The problem with this is we've already called it in, in other places um, with the three variables. <coughs> JavaScript will let us do this, it'll just throw away that third variable. Okay, I need to remember that um, to, to go and search and replace for every call of this function. Um, but what if I had something like this, all right, where I was only using one variable? And we know what the result of this is? No? Okay, so it's not a number again because there's no second argument and it becomes not a number. So it, it, refactoring becomes quite important when you're doing functions and it's quite difficult to make sure you get every case. Um, this can be especially problematic, I suppose, if you're using third-party APIs. Um, so Elm gets around this with its pure functional um, functions, I guess. Um, so here I'm defining a function add that takes two integers and returns an integer, right? Um, so I add them together and they're all type checked, so it's always going to return an integer and Elm will compile unless it does. Um, but they're also curried, which means I, I don't have to call them, I can partially apply the function. I can call that function with add and a single integer and it'll return me a new function that takes another integer and returns an integer. Um, so I can see that then by here as well. Um, so if I took the previous example actually, um, I'm adding two uh, variables and I'm passing it a string. In JavaScript this probably would have worked. Um, I'm going to get a nice neat compiler error. And just to show them the, the example where I pass over one variable, I would get actually a function return type, um, and I would have to pass that another integer to, to be able to execute it. But Elm will type check all this stuff um, at compile time, um, so you won't be able to you won't be able to break it pretty much. Okay, so next is this probably one of the most complex examples in JavaScript, um, and just. Um, just to show how problematic it is, here we have an object, okay, and on the object there's an integer, and we, have, we also have a function, function sorry, it's not an integer, an ID, um, and we print out the, the, the ID on the object. If I call this, um, I might think I should get first ID, and I, I will in this case, but in, in JavaScript there's multiple ways to call things, okay? So if I call with object dot apply, um, function dot apply, and pass it in a null call context, and we know what happens. No, no it's undefined. Yeah, it's undefined, right? Because you lose the this context, okay? So people might think that this context is the same as in Java and other languages, but it's it's absolutely not, okay? It's totally different. Um, but the, there's a bigger problem with this issue. If there was something at a global scope, right? That you know on the on the window or something like that, um, it may use that, so it might be completely different than what you were expecting. Um, I can change this though, I can pass it with an explicit context, I can pass it with ID, and my own object, and it would use the ID off that object. But what if I wanted to execute it asynchronously, right? So I wanted to execute it in 100 milliseconds, I'd typically write something like this, I probably wouldn't even think twice about it, um, and again, my disk context is lost, okay? Um, and again, I have the same problem, it would look up the scope, and it would look up, and uh, it may take something off the window. I can fix this though by wrapping it in a closure. Um, but everybody might do this and it's a little bit complex. So how does Elm get around this, right? So I mentioned already about the pure function. Um, there's, a, there's no this context, so you don't have to worry about the, um, the scope of this and, and what's, what's, what's the call context it is. Um, everything you want to use inside a function is, comes from the parameters you pass in and any module level constant, constants. Okay, so in this fun, uh, example here I have a print function that takes hello world, and what it's doing is it's returning a string because every, every function in Elm must return something because there's no side effects. Um, and it's appending the pretext constant from the module above, um, and then I'm printing that out to the console, or sorry, print that out to the screen. Okay, so the, the last thing I want to talk about is the architecture. So it's one of the key concepts in Elm um, and asynchronous JavaScript. What goes where and the callback hell that you might fall into. So the structure of a typical framework, I've just picked on Angular here for um, no apparent reason, it's the only one I know. Uh, so Angular 1, for example, use contro uh, controllers, directives, views, and services. Your controllers hold your, your view model state, your directives manipulate your DOM, your views um, are your presentation layer, and your services are typically your um, application state or your data fetching. Um, the problem with this is all bi-directional, which means 
pretty much anything can update anything. Um, views are static HTML um, that may or may not contain problems. Like you know, it's difficult to test your views. Um, so moving along to Angular two then, um, it has a similar sort of structure, but it's a bit more web component y right? So instead of controllers, we have stateless and stateful components. We have services, views, modules, um, and uh, they have then a concept of um, immutable store, which they do with the NGRX store. Um, but again, we have same similar problems. Our views are um, pretty much HTML, um, which means we can have bugs. You know, anything can pretty much update anything. And we sit with a lot of side effects and that kind of stuff. Um, then as well, tools, just shoehorned in here as well, um, that you have to worry about when you're building these um, <coughs> products. So build tools, NPN, Bower, uh, Grunt, all that kind of stuff, you have to configure yourself. Um, there's also stuff then to ensure the code uh, developers are adhering to the correct coding standards, so you're using Linton and formatting tools. Um, you also have tree checking, so I don't know, does everybody know what tree checking is? It's pretty much, it's kind of a new concept, a new eye, but it's uh, getting rid of code that you're not using to, write, to reduce the, the file size that you're serving to the client, okay? <coughs> so Angular 2 is really pushing that. Um, and then the virtual DOM, does everybody know what the virtual DOM is? Okay, so the virtual DOM is an uh, in-memory representation of the DOM, uh, and then what happens is that DOM is diffed with the actual real DOM in the browser, and um, up events are just sent between the two just to to reduce the amount of rendering that needs to be done, okay? Um, and then dependency management, um, so problems like MPN and all that kind of stuff that you have um, when uh, you're using public, uh, public JavaScript packages. So a lot of these stuff you get for free in Elm, okay? And a lot of these stuff you get, you will get for free in Elm. So your build tools, so you, you have the um, Elm reactor um, for, for demo and stuff, you still have to do some part of it. Um, the linting formatting, there's Elm format, which um, is a, uh, a consistent formatter for all Elm projects, right? So, and that's going to be built into the language in the next version. Tree shaking as well um, will be built in in the next version, um, so it'll reduce the, the file size that are served to the client. And virtual John, you already get for free in there, and that's why Elm is so, so much faster than the other guys. And uh, dependency management we've already uh, touched on, which for the, the semantic versioning. So you don't have to worry about packages breaking when you download them. So just to, sh to highlight then about, I kind of flipped here a bit with the, the JavaScript callbacks. So this is a typical um, um, callback in JavaScript um, an event on, on a click that you might have. Um, but the problem with these is you can have them scattered all over your code. There's there's no one way, there's no one place that um, you're handling your clicks, or there's no one place that you're handling your, your updates. Um, and then just uh, to give an example then of a promise, so you might use a promise instead of a callback. So a promise is a promise to go and execute some side effect. So typically you might be used for an, uh, an Ajax request or something like that, and you, uh, you implement the, the resolve and reject, so it goes down to two paths. So um, resolve if it's successful, reject if it's a failure. Um, but the problem with this is twofold, right? So you don't have to implement either one of them, right? So you can actually send off a request and do nothing with it or not handle either path. Um, but also, um, you you may want to handle a case where your AJAX request fails, right? So if you, your AJAX request fails, you want to go and do something, you want to go and make another request, retry it essentially. So you end up creating a promise inside a promise and it can be a bit difficult to, to, to get your head around. So how does Elm get around this, right? There's three things you need to worry about now, right? The first thing is your model. Your model can be anything. It can be a record, it can be an integer, anything at all. And, and basically, you just set up that with some initial state. You pass that initial state to your update, um, and your update decides what it's going to do from there. So you will see now in a minute how it, it, could, it can take in uh, external events. But from your update, you return two things. You return your new model and you return a command. So a command is a request to the Elm runtime to execute something, uh, some side effect. So it's an AJAX request, and the, the Elm runtime will execute that and return me a message. The message then will cover all paths, um, so it'll be um, success or failure. And the update me uh, method 
We'll accept that and pattern match on those messages that come in. So essentially your update function is, is just a, a pattern matching on the, the events that come in. So all your all your state is handled inside the update, right? Um, so you return your new model out to Elm, and Elm calls the third thing that you need to implement, your view. So your view is all implemented uh, with static functions um, in Elm, and what it produces is a HTML representation. And the HTML representation can also include messages, which are stuff like on click and stuff like that, and we'll see that in a second. So when we return the, the HTML representation, that goes to the Elm renderer, which does your virtual DOM, does your diffin on the real DOM, and produces events that only update the, the bits that you need to update. So that's where you get your fast rendering from. And then if we click on something in the real representation, Elm has wired in the, the, the messages so our messages get fired back to the Elm runtime, goes back into your update, and the circle completes itself again. So there's three things you need to update, or you need to worry about, the model, update, and view, and that's it. All your state will always be updated in your update function, your view will always be rendered in your view, and your model is your, um, your initial state. So just to give an example of these, um, so here I have a model which is for drag and drop, I don't know if somebody's seen these examples before, and I have an initial state, right? So if a function that's taken in my model, it's going to, it can return a command as well if you like, but um, it doesn't have to. Um, and what I'm doing here is I'm saying, create a new model, give it an initial position of this, and then drag is nothing, so it's a maybe type, if you remember, and then no commands to execute. Um, and this is the update function, so I've just reduced this down to, so you can assume my module is now an integer, just to save line space on the slide. Um, so I'm, I'm doing my pattern matching here, so there's two events coming in, one is an increment, one is a decrement. I amend my model, and sorry, not amend my model, I return a new model because everything in Elm uh, is immutable. Um, and then my view function um, is something like this, so I create a new div by using the div uh, function that takes two arrays. Uh, first array is your list of attributes, your second array is your list of children, a little bit like you'd see in a real DOM. And uh, here, inside the, the div, I have two um, ch uh, child uh, buttons, one is a decrement and one is an increment. So I'm sitting here, on click I produce a, a, a decrement message and on click of this button I produce an increment message. Okay, And that returns the HTML and um, that's capable of producing messages. So just further topics to, to round it off. Um, so I haven't touched on subscriptions but they're a little bit like um, observables in JavaScript. Um, so you might use them for web sockets or listening in for mouse movements and things like that. Um, testing as well, I haven't got a chance to touch on, but because everything in Elm is pure functional, no side effects, everything, everything works in the parameters it's given, testing just becomes a doddle. You don't have to mock any, you don't have to do anything like that. Ports, a little bit more of an advanced feature, and um, it's just a way for, because Elm is so new, it's a way for communicating with other JavaScript libraries or, so it's essentially um, a messaging bus, but um, <coughs> yeah, so you just use it for using a JavaScript library that you, you wouldn't want to, or you would, it hasn't been implemented in Elm already. So I mentioned already about HTML being produced by those functions. There's a CSS library as well for doing the same thing. So CSS is all type checked as, as is your, your HTML. And I mentioned earlier about like partial uh, applying of um, functions. We can do this nicely with our HTML as well. So we can compose functions to build up our HTML and a lot less lines of code. Um, so just to conclusion, um, Elm really simplifies your code. Um, it uh, reduces the number of bugs, like hopefully I've shown. Um, it's easier to upgrade due to the sem uh, semantic versioning. Um, really fast performant UIs. And most importantly, I think it makes front-end development really easy and fun. It's, it's pretty addictive. Um, so that pretty much covers it for me. Um, anybody got any questions? Yeah. Um, I guess the first question is, what is this, right? Because um, like, is it a programming language? And whatever it is that you write on that, you just, I don't know, transpile it to ES5 and then run it in your browser? Or yes, so it? It, it's a programming language developed by um, Evan Kapitsky. Greg, you might help me on that one. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know, I can't pronounce the second name, um, but it's, it was released in 2012 and it's been pretty much run out of no red ink. So it's a, it's a language that compiles down to JavaScript, okay? But it's, it's 
it's pure for, uh, functional, like so there's no side effects and it's, it's very, very easy to test. And, uh, you get all the functionality that you do with code. So if, let's say I have an existing application, let's say whatever, 50,000 lines of code, yeah. and I want to start using Elm, can I just write one module in Elm and then mix and match with my existing whatever ES6? We have a monolith project with, I think, 5 million lines of code. Um, you can imagine much JavaScript's in that, um, and we're trying to do it at the minute. It's actually really simple, because what you can do is, you can just take any little piece of your application, <coughs> convert that to Elm, you don't have to commit everything like you do in Java and Angular or anything like that. It's not big bang. Um, you do little bits, and not only that, you do you compile, the, you can combine the little bits. So you can have, let's say, your side menu, write that in Elm, get it all working, te test it outside the application too, um, and then compile it down to JavaScript. And you just insert your JavaScript file in your application and say, okay, at that div, I want to change that to um, my Elm application. And I could have multiple ones of those and compile up three or four different files, you know, to get little apps around my application and it produce me a single file and I push that in and just tell it where to, where to do the Elm app. Um, you can you expand it out then to, to uh, single page applications when you get to the point where you want to commit to it, but um, there's no requirement to do that. Perfect, thanks. <laughs> you mentioned something about browsers and variations in JavaScript between browsers. Does mm -hmm. Elm help with that? Yeah, it does. So, um, Angular 2 will work in quite a few browsers, but you have to polyfill them, like, so you'll have to turn on some things. You get all your polyfills automatically in Elm. Um, so I think it supports, I think it's uh, IE 11 up. So I think that's what it's for. I'm not 100% sure now, but um, yeah, the polyfills are, are in the, the runtime. Any other questions? Okay, super. No testing question, Rob, no? No, you're right, <laughs> oh, oh, sorry, I think I'm nervous Thanks. Oh, yeah. Um, I was wondering, after uh, tree shaking and minification, amplification, all the rest of it, mm. uh, what's the size of the shipped file, essentially? Yeah, it's uh, not great at the minute. Um, I actually was talking about that yesterday on the Slack channel. Um, so at the minute, it's that's coming in the next release, which they're a little bit flaky about when it, when it will come, but the tree shaking isn't there yet, okay? Um, so what they suggest is you use Uglify or something like that to reduce your file size. I think I did uh, the little bit I did in the, the live code, and I think that was like 256K, so it's quite large, but you're getting your full end runtime in that, so you can equate that to, you know, what they're taking their pull down jQuery and all that kind of stuff too.